Um, well, I grew up in Toronto. I was born in Poland, and uh, but my family left when I was quite small, and then we moved to uh, London in England, and actually ended up in Toronto almost just by mistake because my parents were trying to go to Australia just to kind of have an adventure and the Australian embassy lost their papers and so a friend of theirs was saying oh well, we're going to Canada why don't you and I guess at that point Canada was this sort of exciting different place and so they ended up in Toronto and my dad um, my dad is a, a painter and my, they were making jewelry and not for a second did they plan to stay long term and then life just kind of happened and we stayed. <laughs> but yeah, so I grew up in Toronto. Even my uh, first year out of high school, I didn't think I was going to uh, be an artist or I didn't plan on going to school to do that. I wanted to be a writer, actually. Um, I went to a pretty wonderful high school um, called Seed. It was an alternative high school in Toronto. Um, where people were able to, uh, well, be in, in control of what kind of uh, topics we were learning about. So at the beginning of every year, we would get together in uh, the common room. And the, the school maybe had about 50 students. It was quite small. We get together in the common room, and we would, um, you know, you'd put your hand up if you had an idea for a course. And you know, you'd say, I, I would like to study 17th century literature. And as long as you had three other people that would also be interested in taking the class, um, then they would teach it. And if the topic was so out there that none of the, uh, I think maybe we had five or six teachers, if none of the teachers knew anything about it, they would find a, a catalyst from the community, so somebody that could teach it, and then it would just be overseen by um, one of the profs. So it was a really amazing place that um, in a way, I don't think I have been able to find since, even in, in university, uh, that kind of um, fusion of so many cool people that had lots of really um, different interests. You know, it was pretty wonderful. But at that point, yeah, I wanted to be a writer, and I wanted to, I just wanted to read all the time and, and study literature. And so when I got out of there, I went to U of T, um, but was we just didn't enjoy the experience coming out of um, seed in these really tight-knit small classes where everyone was so um, involved in what they were doing. Suddenly I was in this huge auditorium with, I, I think the art history class was, I don't know, it feels like a thousand people. I mean, it, it may be my usual exaggeration, but it was a huge auditorium and then this tiny little professor with this little red pointer pointing at things on this huge screen and I had a really hard time just uh, taking in the information and um, so at the same time I actually took a course at OCAD that was at that point still just art history and uh, the experience there was much more what I was looking for where the class was really really small and uh, it was quite self-directed even though it was a, well, I guess it would have been a second year class. OCAD at that point had this uh, the possibility of taking classes as um, a part-time student which allowed you to not just that you could take things, you know, not take a full course load, but you were sort of able to take whatever you wanted. Whereas once you were a full-time student, you had to follow their uh, rules of, you know, the first year classes that lead you to the second year, um, you know, which is a good idea. But it, the the part-time thing just let me kind of get in through the back door and do what I wanted, and I just loved being there. And so this the year following, I just switched and I did. Um, a full degree and so somewhere along in that year I guess I decided that I wanted to study art um, but it definitely wasn't one of those things that I kind of knew I wanted to do partly maybe because it was my dad was an artist and so it was such a big part of my life all the time anyway we always went to museums and galleries and looked at stuff and talked about stuff that maybe it just felt like it was something that would always be in my life but not necessarily something I needed to study but it's something I've thought of quite a bit as a teacher, as somebody that is around students of art all the time. And I guess I've never really figured out why it was that way, because I don't think I could really do anything other than be an artist. Um, but I guess maybe it takes a while to figure that out. When I was at OCAD, I remember being told that Western was a really good school if I wanted to continue in teaching. And I always thought that that was something that I'd love to do. 
Um, at, I don't know if so much anymore, but at that point it was, so it would have been about 10 years ago now, it was known to be a very theoretical school. The, the written thesis component was um, quite large compared to, let's say, Guelph or some of the other schools. Um, and so that was what attracted me to Western. I've always loved school. Um, and I, I was on a panel just the other day, and somehow that came up because we were, we were talking about um, you know, what you should do to continue in your field when you graduate. And uh, I realized that I've sort of not been out of school since kindergarten. Um, and I remember when I was finishing at OCAD in my fourth year, the concept of taking time in between your undergrad and your graduate studies was kind of really popular. And um, a lot of people felt really strongly that that was sort of very important and that if you didn't do that, that you were somehow not going to get your full experience out of your grad studies, that somehow you wouldn't be ready. Um, and I, I, I think going from one to the next was really good for me, that I think in between it would have just been a waste of time. Um, but yeah, how does it factor into being a professor? Um, I mean, I guess being a professor, everything you do would factor into that, but I never, and I guess most professors would be in the same boat. You think about it sometimes that uh, if you're teaching high school, if you're teaching uh, elementary school, you, you sort of taught how to teach, whereas at university you focus on your field, you focus on, you know, doing as much as you can in, in, in your own direction, and then the teaching just sort of comes. Uh, yeah, so I've recently um, started working at uh, DNA Art Space, um, which is a new uh, commercial gallery, uh, but new and, and quite experimental. Uh, so it's, it's a fun place to be. Um, I think my, my term is uh, associate director. Uh, but it's, it's extra fun now because uh, we don't have a set roster of artists yet, so it's my job to, to find people. It's just that much more kind of open and, and exciting at this point. Um, but yeah, so I do, I do three different things in some way, I guess, in, if you think about it. I, I teach, I, uh, I work in the studio, and uh, I work at the gallery. Um, I mean, I do see those things as very intricately connected. Um, and I do think that sort of, in, I guess, in relation to the last question, I do think that the, the three really feed into each other and, and um, add a lot to each other. I, I, I wouldn't be able to teach art if I didn't make art. But I think as an artist, I also have, um, well, I, th I think I have an interesting point of view while I curate, um, which maybe isn't different from anybody else, but uh, I do like the, the connection for myself, even just as a kind of um, added research component to my own practice or something, if that makes sense. I'm new to all three being together at the same time since DNA is, is quite new. Um, and I was reading something, I can't remember who it was, it was a, well-known writer from a long time ago. Um, I have the worst mind for, for remembering names, but he was talking about um, how he couldn't make plans for uh, an evening dinner party because it would just stop him from being productive all day because he knew that that, that thing was coming up at the end of the day, even if it was you know 10 hours of a day that he could, could, could work in and, and even if he never worked more than those 10 hours, it was still just that idea that, that some other thing was looming that would just kind of bind him and, and disallow him from being able to work. And uh, I used to feel that way where, you know, if I was teaching at 2.30, even though I had an eight-hour day before that, it was so hard to, to focus on, on the studio because you kind of, in some ways, just want to start preparing for your class all day. And uh, I think maybe that's a personality thing more than, I used to always, I would start reading a book and I had to finish it. I couldn't 
read three or four books at a time, which a lot of my friends would do. You know, you finish that one and then you move on to the next one. Um, so I find that hard, but I think like anything, it's just something you kind of learn to do because definitely now my life is more divided into these quite short increments of three to four hours at each thing that I do. Um, you know, so maybe it's not the perfect situation, but uh, on the flip side, I think you just, you just start working differently. And I've noticed that my attention kind of jumps and then wanes. Um, maybe that's just because I've gotten used to kind of working in those spurts, that when I do have a full day, I kind of, at the end of that four hours, I, I feel like I need something to kind of get me going again. It's funny. I guess we just sort of adapt to, to most situations. I work collaboratively with Jason Hallows, um, and so we work under the name Parker Branch. Um, so my studio practice is uh, is that I, I very rarely make work um, on my own anymore. It's all um, sort of been eaten up by that project, which um, is really exciting. It's it's a it's a great thing to be able to work with somebody because, well, I guess if it works, <laughs> but for us it really works because you have that moment when you do something and it's just too weird and too crazy and I think if you're on your own you question it so much, at least I do. Um, so to have someone else to kind of bounce off all the time and uh, um, sort of say like, oh yeah, that's, that's totally screwed up, but it's, it's, it works, you know, works somehow, really helps. Um, and the way we work these days, um, it has kind of evolved and changed quite a bit. We're not in the studio together very often, um, so we sort of take turns doing stuff, and then we come back and sort of things are done, and then sometimes we'll, you know, you'll, you'll go up to something that has been kind of worked on, and then you add to it, you change it. Um, Sometimes you'll come back and what you've done will be, um, you know, totally moved and often it just have, will have a small, I keep looking around to sort of point at examples, but um, it'll have a sort of small change. Um, and then we sort of, we come together in the evenings outside of the studio and uh, talk about things and work through things verbally, um, which I think in a way is maybe the largest part of the collaboration. Um, more than anything because of just time restraints. Um, we rarely have the same bit of time so that we can actually be. I think I'm just always excited about the next thing. Um, so we've got a show coming up um, in a couple of weeks at YYZ and uh, we're working with these uh, found aprons, uh, vintage aprons that have really kind of interesting patches on them. And that's been the kind of uh, impetus for this show. Often the work will begin with some object or some image and then sort of spiral almost out of control, but from that um, point of origin. So the aprons are the, the starting point this time. And so that's what I'm, I'm excited about. I think it's hard to kind of pick things from the past that, you know, maybe if you did like the the Venice Biennale or something really enormous, then that would be sort of an obvious answer. But um, yeah, I think that's the best way I can answer that, that the next thing is always um, the fun one. I was talking to a student recently who was really stressed out about um, one of the tests, and I was trying to explain how every time you finish your test, there's always a bigger one up ahead. You know, you, your, your final thesis in undergrad is such a big deal, and then when you're doing your thesis for your master's, you realize, why was I so worried about that thesis in undergrad? And I used to be like that all through elementary school and in high school, everything was so stressful, it mattered so much, and that in retrospect, I mean, maybe that worry and that, that stress is what kind of allows you to succeed, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, but in retrospect, it's, it's, it's maybe easier to kind of see that you can relax about, a lot, about those things because the next one will be bigger and it just kind of keeps growing that way. The scene is much smaller, it's much more intimate um, in the way that Toronto does have sort of various groups and various, um, I mean there's so many galleries compared to 
to how many we have in, in London. That there's definitely, you know, different, um, um, different scenes almost of, of, of people um, and places to go. Um, it's very tight-knit in London. Uh, but I think it's lovely. I mean, there's reasons why I guess we are still here. Um, and more and more artists are, uh, you know, they're leaving Toronto, they're coming to London, they're coming to Hamilton, um, where it's just much easier to live and to, to exist as, as an artist. Um, you know, of course there's more opportunities in Toronto, but I think London offers a much easier way of life. We were doing some studio visits just uh, last week in Toronto and uh, just visiting people's spaces. Uh, they're so tiny and, and uh, you know, which is just how, how things are. But even compared to 10 years ago um, when I was in Toronto, the kind of spaces we had then, the size and the, you know, we always had sort of live, work, studio spaces. and. Uh, things are definitely much more expensive now and so therefore much more harder. Um, we did a Skype visit with uh, a curator in this space and the first couple of minutes she just kept um, exclaiming how big our space is. Oh my god, your space is so big, it's so big. And um, you don't quite realize it, you know, how much more time you have to work when, um, you know, your space, even just one example that your space is your studio space is less expensive and, and much more sort of open to experimentation because you have the space to leave things that maybe aren't fully realized to just kind of ponder over for a while because you don't have to move it out to do the next thing. It's pretty wonderful. I think DNA is a pretty special place. Um, it's run entirely by women. So the, the bookshop is run by Ruth Skinner. The gallery assistant is Abby Vincent. Uh, I'm the director, Alison Maddock is the, uh, the owner and the director. So there's something really special about uh, the space. Um, and the, once again, it's so large and expansive. It, it almost feels more like a museum, um, but still is able to be quite experimental. Um, so I mean, I think if you, know, you go back to the kind of uh, 70s and, and Forest City Gallery, that there's a sort of possibility to, to play and to experiment, um, maybe just because uh, we are able to do so, because rent is less and buildings cost less. Um, Parker Branch, uh, the collaboration that I work under, began as a storefront space. So uh, maybe seven years ago, we had rented this tiny storefront, I mean very, very small. The owner used to um, joke that it must have been a one-chair barber shop because there's nothing else that we could imagine would fit in there. But um, yeah, it began as a kind of curatorial project that blurred the lines between um, artwork and found objects and um, we were interested in just creating a space that was sort of allow you to just look and enjoy and, and ponder the things around you, but not really be clear as to what the categories are of the things that you're looking at. Um, but to be able to do something like that coming from a place like Toronto was just unheard of, you know, that, that we could just run this space that, um, you know, in no um, point of our imagination did we think it was going to somehow bring in any money that the rent was just so small that we could just kind of pay for it every month. Um, so, it, it, and we have galleries like Carl Louis, which runs on that same uh, pretext where, you know, two artists have gotten together and they've, they've started this amazing space showing really wonderful work from, from London, from New York, from all over the place. Um, it would just be that much more difficult or impossible to do that in a place like um, Toronto. I've thought about this quite a lot, I think, in the context of teaching. And uh, what I always come back to is the intensity that we bring to looking at artwork um, is really special. The way that we are able to kind of 
focus on, on an object or an image and just spend the time to really, um, you know, read it, really look at the, and, and whether it's conceptual or whether it's just sort of enjoying, you know, the shapes or the colors of something, it, it, it's the same. I don't really see one as better than the other, but that, that um, moment of attention is very important. And I think when we just sort of go about our daily whatevers, rarely do we bring that kind of attention to um, what we do. And I'm, you know, as guilty of that as anybody. How often I get on my bicycle on the way home from, from the university and I'm thinking about so many things that, you know, suddenly you realize you're at, at the red light three quarters into your ride and you really have no memory of of turning left or right or doing any of the things that, that you must have done, but just in a kind of, as an automaton, you've done it so many times that you just don't pay attention. Um, and I'm probably worse for it than most people because I'm such a dreamy person. I'm in my head so often. But then when you go into the gallery, because you're, or wherever, if you know you're looking at an artwork, um, you bring that attention because you're conscious of the fact that that's what you're doing in that moment. Um, but I guess it comes down to especially the kind of work that um, people do where the lines between the work and the not work are blurred, um, which puts you as the viewer into this place where, hopefully anyway, where you bring that same attention to the not work because you're not quite sure where, which is which and what is what. but you're still in that same place looking at something, trying to figure out what it is. Um, so I think the magic of, of, of art is to somehow communicate that or somehow bring that same attention to other things, um, that same way of looking. Um, yeah, because that way I guess it, it broadens the scope. Um, it's no longer just about the work itself, but about something that really affects everybody. And in some ways it's a it's a small and significant thing, right? It's not it's not necessarily talking about changing the world or or any kind of a grand idea, but I think that kind of modest um, impact is 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 maybe stronger than anything else because um, maybe it's more real or it's more possible or something. Yeah, I think I've always been attracted to work that isn't sort of in an obvious way trying to do something very grandiose. Maybe because I don't believe it. Maybe that's what it is. But yeah. I would say that it was more of the same. It's hard to, I mean, there's the kind of obvious bringing together of people and, and I guess some work does that more than other work, or some spaces um, do that more than others. Um, we did a, a piece at Parker Branch uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I can't remember what the title was of the show, but people call it The Bread Show. And uh, we just asked everybody that we knew, um, and they could ask anybody, it was sort of a completely open call. Um, to just make bread if they if they made bread um, to make bread and to bring it and uh, the exhibition was just um, the bread and wood we had just kind of wood stumps and just raw pieces of wood placed on top of the the wood stumps um, oh and there was a David Merritt in the 70s made a, a wooden bread sculpture which really blended in with everything so much that you know, unless you looked closely, you weren't fully sure right away um, that it wasn't just another loaf of bread. But we ended up with, I think, maybe 15 or so various uh, loaves that people had made. Um, and the smell was really kind of a big deal because the space is so small, so the smell of the bread was really overwhelming. And there's also a kind of earthy smell because we um, we got the stumps from a farm just before we were sort of, you know, brushing all the mud off. But so there was those two smells, and it was really um, wonderful. But the space was really small, so to get all of that in there and then have everybody sitting around, um, everyone was really 
forced to interact with everybody else, as opposed to kind of a large space that we used to always joke that, you know, we'd have 10 people at the opening and it felt like it was just completely packed and bustling because you'd be so close to everyone else. Um, but so I guess work like that is really important because it does bring people together in a very obvious, very um, absolute kind of way, very concrete way. Um, but like any community, um, people come together because they're doing similar things and, um, you know, maybe um, in the art community we're extra lucky because um, art does have to be shown somewhere, so we end up with these, with galleries, with these spaces, whether experimental or different kind, but there are sort of venues where people get together and, and look at the work, and um, maybe not every community has that um, outside of the kind of workplace, um, but I think it would be uh, weird to say that, you know, what, that the art community somehow um, has that more than any other, uh, you know, doctors or any other group. But it's, it's, it's hard to say. I'm sure that some people would argue that because art is about communication and about talking that somehow that's something special. But I don't know if I agree. In some ways I think it's just, it's just another community, another grouping, right? People go through the world just trying to find others that they can somehow connect with. So, as artists, we've just done it as well. I don't know.